On the 7th of October 2001, the United States, led by then President George W. Bush, and with the support of British troops, began the invasion of Afghanistan. It was a direct response to the attacks against the Twin Towers on September 11th. Our response involves far more than instant retaliation and isolated strikes. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign, unlike any other we have ever seen. In just a few weeks, the Taliban were ousted from power. Their leader, Malar Omar, had to take refuge in the mountains, and the organization led by bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, suffered a severe blow. However, almost 20 years later, and after more than 7,000 casualties of soldiers and contractors from the United States and other NATO countries, after more than 70,000 casualties suffered by the Afghan army and police, and after an expenditure of more than $2 trillion, the war came to an end. Of course, no one could have imagined the outcome of the longest war in the history of the United States of America. After a titanic effort, the Taliban regained power, and the Americans faced a painful withdrawal characterized by chaos, haste, and even jihadist attacks by ISIS. So, there goes 20 years down the drain. In a past video here on Visual Politic, we looked at key factors that explained the rapid fall of the Republic of Afghanistan to the Taliban forces. However, we left many questions unanswered. For example, how on earth did the Taliban manage to resist the onslaught of the great American power? And what are their links to the international terrorism? And perhaps the most important question of all, what future does Afghanistan now face? What will the Taliban government look like? Well, in this second video, in the Afghanistan trilogy, we're going to answer all of these questions. Although those of you who support us on Patreon have already received some keynotes in our exclusive weekly snapshot. Thank you very much, by the way, for all your support. Now, the first thing, the fundamental thing to understand, first of all, is who exactly the Taliban are. Listen up. Politics in religious fundamentalism. The Taliban originated in the early 1990s. After the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan in 1989, the warlords who had been supported by the United States took de facto power. I salute Chairman Khalis, his delegation, and the people of Afghanistan themselves. You are a nation of heroes. The result was an accumulation of infighting, massive corruption, and the emergence of political strongmen. The country even descended into civil war for control of power. That was the window of opportunity for the Taliban. A group of religious fanatics led by Malar Omar promised to end anarchy and impose Islamic values. In 1996, they achieved their goal to enter Kabul and take control of the country. After their arrival in Kabul, they proclaimed an Islamic emirate and imposed on Afghanistan one of the strictest and most insane religious dictatorships in history. Punishments were inhumane, minorities were massacred, and women were effectively no longer considered human beings. Terrible. Of course, as you all know, they also harbored terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, which is why the United States invaded the country in 2001 in response to the attack on the Twin Towers. And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. The Taliban are a radical religious military group, an organization led by fanatics who have not hesitated to use any weapon at their disposal, including cruel attacks. However, in 2014, there was a certain shift. The then Taliban leader, Malar Mansour, argued that the group also had to take on a political strategy and win popular support, not through fear, but through management and control of corruption. From that moment on, the Taliban opened an office in Doha to facilitate international negotiations, began to be concerned about the management of public services and to persecute corrupt officials. For example, they made sure that doctors who were paid by the Afghan government went to work in the public hospital instead of being paid and working exclusively in private clinics. They also included Tajiks and Uzbeks in the Taliban leadership council to extend their influence beyond the Pashtun areas. It was all a strategy that allowed them to gain a lot of popular support. And as we have seen, the strategy was a success. Sure, let's take a moment. Make no mistake, strategy is one thing. Their goal is quite another. When Mansour fell in 2016 after a US drone strike, the group named this guy Supreme Leader. A guy so radical that he not only advocates self-sacrifice, but he even encouraged his own son to become a martyr. He sacrificed himself at the age of 23. But now that we know them better, there are questions that we have to answer. For example, after 20 years of war, how did they survive? Which basically amounts to asking, how on earth did the Taliban finance all their activity? Well, pay attention, because it seems to me that the answer to this question is not going to leave you indifferent.
the Colombia of opium. You may not get the impression at first glance, but the truth is that over the past few years, the Taliban have become perhaps the best funded insurgent group in the world. To give you an idea, according to the United States estimates, before taking power, the Taliban had an income of between $300 million and $1.6 billion a year. And it is not only the United Nations, most sources point to incomes that each year exceed the threshold of $1 billion. Come on, they are no amateurs. We're talking about a real fighting force, a well-funded, well-trained, and well-structured organization. Now, the question is, the big question that we can all ask ourselves is, where on earth did the Taliban get the money? Well, essentially, from a huge catalog of criminal activities, such as narcotics, extortion, and illegal mining. And then along with that, donations from countries like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. But of all of them, narcotics took the cake. And the fact is that there's no other way to say it. Afghanistan is to opium what Colombia is to white powder. <laughs> According to the United States Office on Drugs and Crime, Afghanistan produces almost 90% of the world's opium, the key substance for the production of heroin. Afghanistan has thus become one of the most significant narco states on the planet, a nerve center supplying a large number of the world's narcotics markets. Not only that, but in recent years, the industry has begun to diversify. In addition to opium, they have begun using ephedra, a plant that grows all over the country to make ephedrine and methamphetamine, two compounds that are far more lucrative than opium and that counter narcotics officials in the now defunct Afghan government call a coming catastrophe for the world. Well, the fact is that the Taliban get their share of this lucrative illegal industry. It is estimated to be at least 10% of the total revenue. Precisely for this reason, it is no surprise that the three main opium producing provinces of Helmand, Kandahar, and Uruzgan are Taliban strongholds. And take note, because we are not talking about pocket money. Exports of opium, its derivatives, and methamphetamines are the largest export and the largest productive activity in the country. In fact, Afghanistan's narcotics-related exports far exceed all other exports combined. We are talking about figures that would far exceed $3 billion per year according to existing estimates. Therefore, the Taliban empire would have been receiving between $300 and $500 million every year. Opium cultivation and heroin production is more dangerous than the Soviet invasion and attack on our country. It is more dangerous than the factional fighting in Afghanistan. It is more dangerous than terrorism. Hamid Karzai, former president of Afghanistan. What is perhaps more paradoxical is that, despite being a source of financing for the Taliban, the area dedicated to poppy plantations, from which opium is extracted, has not stopped growing. And yet the expansion has happened at the same time that Americans have spent more than $9 billion trying to tackle the problem. $9 billion that have served absolutely no purpose. Because since the invasion of the United States, when, by the way, the Taliban themselves had forbidden its cultivation, the size of the plantations has multiplied by no less than 40. But narcotics were far from the Taliban's only source of income. Mining has been another important source of funding. According to information gathered by the UN, in 2020, the Taliban were able to earn some $400 million from taxes on illegal mines, an amount that coincides with many independent estimates, and far exceeds what the Afghan government itself collected from the sector. In fact, the Taliban made it a priority to secure control of the region's richest in minerals as soon as possible in order to secure this important source of financing. From lapis lazuli mines in northern Badakhshan, to gold, lead and zinc mines in Helmand, or talc and marble mines in southern Nan. Gaha. The Taliban issued mining licenses, controlled transport, and even organized the workforce. And along with narcotics and mining, tolls on highways and border crossings were another very important source of income. And so, that is how the Taliban built a criminal empire that gave them enough resources to fund their 70,000 to 100,000 man army by supplies, by weapons, by Afghan officials. And that's how they finally won the war. But now that we know how they survived, and given that they are back in power, the question the key question is, what exactly are their ties to international terrorism? Listen up. From faction to faction. Let's see. 
The United States and NATO invaded Afghanistan almost 20 years ago, precisely because of the Taliban's harboring of the terrorist organization Al-Qaeda. And with the Taliban back in power, we could come to think that it's back to square one. All Al-Qaeda supporters are celebrating the developments. It's a victory over the United States, which is what they hope to achieve. A lot of groups will piggyback on this victory in propaganda terms. If the Taliban can do it, you can do it. Peter Newman, Professor of Security Studies at King's College. College, London. However, if the agreement with the Taliban reached by the Trump administration and then taken up by the administration has made anything clear, it's that in exchange for all the moves that we have seen with the fall of Afghanistan, the Taliban are committed to preventing terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a center of operations and a safe haven. The question is, can the Taliban be trusted? Well, here there are opinions for all tastes. There are analysts who think that the Taliban have learned their lesson and that they will not be willing to risk their power for organizations like Al-Qaeda. Others take it for granted that this group and others like it will be revitalized because the Taliban simply will not go after them. And pay attention because you know what? US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin himself testified in the Senate that the risk of this happening is significant. How would you rate the the likelihood of international terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS regenerating inside of Afghanistan uh, and presenting a threat to our homeland and our allies, given what you see today. Is it uh, small, medium, large? How would you assess it? I would assess it as medium. I would also say, Senator, that, uh, that uh, it would take uh, possibly uh, two years for them to develop that capability. I concur with that, and I think that uh, if certain other things happen, if there was a collapse of the government or a, a dissolution of the Afghan security forces, that risk would obviously increase. But right okay. now, I'd say medium and in about two years or so. For the time being, a report to the United Nations Security Council in May 2021 indicated that Al-Qaeda is present in at least 15 Afghan provinces and that it continues to maintain close contact with the Taliban, although they have kept a low profile so as to not torpedo the Doha Agreement. According to the same report, religious affinity, family relations through marriages between the two groups, and years of fighting together means that the ties between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are still strong. Yet, Al-Qaeda may be the least of our worries. The organization is very weakened, according to a report by the US Department of Defense. It is basically focused on survival. And in addition, its leader, Al-Zawahiri, seems to be ill. Today, the biggest threat to the international community seems to come from what is known as ISIS-K, the Islamic State Khorasan province, the faction of ISIS that was responsible for the horrific terrorist attack at Kabul airport. Carnage at Kabul airport. 13 American soldiers, more than 100 dead. The point is that in principle, ISIS-K is a rival group of the Taliban. In fact, when the Taliban came to Kabul, when they took control of the prison, look at what they did next. Taliban executes former ISK chief a year after Afghan government jailed him. ISIS-K came to the country in 2015 and gained devotees among disgruntled Taliban. Let's say it presents itself as a more fundamentalist alternative to the Taliban, which is saying something. And of course, they try to achieve the highest level of violence possible. Attacks on schools, hospitals, and all kinds of extreme barbarities. In fact, both the United States and the rest of the international community, including Russia and China, see them as a danger, the real danger in Afghanistan. Well, the fact is that they are a rival group for the Taliban, which is why they are practically at war and have clashed on numerous occasions. But are they really so far apart? The Taliban are far closer to the Islamic State than they claim. Sarjan M. Gohel, the International Security Director of the Asia Pacific Foundation in Foreign Policy. And take note, because this is not an isolated opinion. And this is when we come to the Haqqani Network. The Haqqani Network is the most radical, violent, and militarily better prepared branch of the Taliban. Something like the Praetorian Guard of the new Islamic Emirate. I do not believe that anyone in the West fully understands the reach of the Haqqani Network. It is the single most impressive non-state terrorist group I have seen, with the exception of ISIS in the first two years of the Caliphate. Michael K. Nagata, retired US Army Lieutenant General and former Director of Strategy at the National Cal 
Counterterrorism Center. Well, this Haqqani network, unlike the Taliban, is considered by the United States as a terrorist group. And no wonder. This organization, among many other actions, has been responsible for terrible attacks that have cost the lives of hundreds and hundreds of US soldiers, citizens of allied countries, and the Afghan army. Well, there are indications that this Haqqani network has indeed collaborated and is collaborating with ISIS-K, to whom it would provide technical assistance in exchange for pursuing joint objectives. And beware, because for many, the Kabul airport bombing itself indirectly benefited the Taliban and the Haqqani network. And yes, the Haqqani network is the organization that is in charge of security in Kabul and had the airport surrounded. So that's the way things stand. The United States' hope for preventing Afghanistan from turning into an absolute and total debacle is that the Taliban keep their word. After all, they are the ones in power. So what do you think the new Taliban state will be like? What can we expect? Listen up. A new Taliban state? Okay, the Taliban have won. They have won a landslide victory, and almost 20 years after the American invasion, they are back in power. But so much for their days of celebration, because the truth is that now they face a complicated scenario. It is true that they have seemed to have come in with more popularity than they had when they were kicked out, in part because of the extreme corruption of the government and institutions of the Republic of Afghanistan, but they are still going to have a tough time. The Taliban now face a scenario of economic crisis, factional fighting, and possible pockets of resistance. Remember that the Afghan government was terribly dependent on international aid. More than 75% of government spending came from donations from other countries that have now been suspended. What's more, the brain drain caused by citizens fleeing from the Taliban and many of their draconian measures, such as keeping women out of the labor market, promises to cause a lot of problems. In addition, they have also promised a war on opium, a product on which they have so far financed themselves. The problem is, not only will that take a lot of resources away from the local Taliban leaders, but it could also fuel pockets of violence between the traffickers and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Afghans who basically live off that trade. And all of that is a perfect cocktail for conflict. In theory, it is expected that the Taliban will place a 12-man council at the top to govern Afghanistan. Below this body, a more technocratic government, and then a kind of revolutionary guard formed by the Haqqani network. In other words, the system could resemble the one established in Iran. In any case, we cannot forget that we are talking about a radical and fundamentalist group. Many media have speculated that this time they will be more moderate. But whatever is the case, what we can expect is nothing short of a very, very radical government. In Afghanistan, a very strict interpretation of Sharia law will be applied. Women will be de facto expelled from public life and many will lose their position in terms of civil rights or professional status. In fact, in many provinces, restrictions on women's work, public presence, education, and even access to healthcare are already being reinstated. Radio and television broadcasts of women's music and voices banned in Kandahar. The Taliban ruling Afghanistan may be the lesser evil for the United States, but it is still a tragedy. Even more so if we take into account that it has broken the tendency of Muslim countries to moderate and reject fundamentalist movements. And that is provided that they keep their word about not tolerating terrorist organizations. If that does not happen, then the disaster will be total and absolute. So. What can I say? At the moment, their word about general amnesty and not persecuting their enemies has more holes in it than Swiss cheese, because there have already been numerous cases of murder, torture, and persecution against their opponents, and that is just terrible. But having got to this point, it's your turn. Do you think that the Taliban will keep their word and crack down on terrorism in Afghanistan? Do you think that they will be less radical? What position should the international community take now? Leave us your answers in the comments, and if you found this video interesting, please like it. For our part, we are already prepared the third installment of this trilogy, where we will be talking about China, Russia, and the future potential of the country. See you soon on Visual Politics.